Hello all, I don't want this to be a long video, but I watched the distributist reply to Danny Deschamps about individualism with a mixture of frustration and horror. It was like seeing two people fumbling around in the dark. Now I don't really know who Danny Deschamps is, but I do really like the distributist and want to try to aid in his understanding here. He said in his video that he wanted to present the Steelman version of individualism, but I'm afraid on this score, Dave failed miserably. So in the next five or six minutes, I want to give you the strongest version of individualism that comes out of the classical liberal tradition. First, though, I think it's worth saying that no one in this classical liberal tradition, not the Austrian school, the Chicago school, or their enlightenment forebears ever denied that people band together in groups. David Hume, Adam Smith's good friend, has an essay called Of Parties in General, which I suggest everybody go and look at, in which he talks about the troublesome human propensity to splinter off into factions and fight. In those days, they called it factionalism. These days, we call it tribalism. Nobody denies this. The question comes down to what is the best for everyone? I want to get down to some definitions here because one of my complaints about this debate is how nebulous these terms individualism and collectivism have been. I think the best way to do this is to look at one of the most widely misunderstood quotations of all time from Mrs. Thatcher. She says, They are casting their problems at society, and you know, there's no such thing as society. There are individual men and women, and there are families. And no government can do anything except through people, and people must look after themselves first. It is our duty to look after ourselves, and then also to look after our neighbours. Now here, Thatcher was channeling F.A. Hayek, and she did not literally mean that there is no such thing as society. What she meant was that there is no decision-making unit called society that can act in any meaningful way. There are no decisions taken by collectives, only individual men and women. Now, does that stop people banding together and choosing leaders to speak on their behalf in the way that David Hume described? No, it doesn't. But even in those cases, individual leaders and their underlings are actors within the system, actors with their own personal incentives. This is the central theory of the public choice school, which analyzes the incentives of government agencies, officials, civil servants, politicians, and so on and so forth. When Thomas Sowell says that civil rights have been good for civil rights leaders, but not for black people as a whole, this is the sort of analysis he is doing. And the name for this analysis is methodological individualism. Let me remind you that in the allocation of scarce resources which have alternative uses, there are only two methods of allocation, trade and force. Trade is a positive sum game in which two agents cooperate for mutually beneficial outcomes. I win and you win. Force is a zero sum game in which only one agent can win. I win and you lose. Hence, the free market is based entirely on cooperation and anti-market economic systems, no matter which fancy names you give them, are based on force. When steel workers band together to form the Steel Worker Union and lobby Washington for special protections from foreign trade or other subsidies, they do succeed in winning for themselves, but it comes at the cost of everyone else. For example, the benefits and costs of the 1980 steel tariffs are estimated as follows. US Steel managed to save 5,000 jobs and make an additional $260 million in profits. But everyone else, as a result of the higher price of steel, ended up losing 26,000 jobs and around $600 million in profits. So steel did win, but everyone else lost. And this is the logic of collective action. I win, you lose. Let's remind ourselves of the logic of the market. Here's Milton Friedman. Look at this lead pencil. 
There's not a single person in the world who could make this pencil. Remarkable statement? Not at all. The wood from which it's made, for all I know, comes from a tree that was cut down in the state of Washington. To cut down that tree, it took a saw. To make the saw, it took steel. To make the steel, it took iron ore. This black center, we call it lead, but it's really graphite, compressed graphite. I'm not sure where it comes from, but I think it comes from some mines in South America. This red top up here, the eraser, bit of rubber, probably comes from Malaya, where the rubber tree isn't even native. It was imported from South America by some businessmen with the help of the British government. This brass ferrule, I haven't the slightest idea where it came from, or the yellow paint, or the paint that made the black lines, or the glue that holds it together. Literally thousands of people cooperated to make this pencil. People who don't speak the same language, who practice different religions, who might hate one another if they ever met. When you go down to the store and buy this pencil, you are, in effect, trading a few minutes of your time for a few seconds of the time of all those thousands of people. What brought them together and induced them to cooperate to make this pencil? There was no commissar sending out offices from, sending out orders from some central office. It was a magic of the price system, the impersonal operation of prices that brought them together and got them to cooperate to make this pencil so that you could have it for a trifling sum. That is why the operation of the free market is so essential, not only to promote productive efficiency, but even more to foster harmony and peace among the peoples of the world. Now, Distributist has a section in which he discusses free markets in his video. Uh, in which he runs into all sorts of problems by forgetting some of these very basic principles I've been talking about. Let's uh, watch him for a while. Now, this next example is a lot better. The concept of the market as a driving force in human affairs and in human actions was one of the motivating inputs and motivating observations for Enlightenment thinkers like Adam Smith to conceptualize an idea of individualism as we know it today. The idea is generally that inside some organized political body where security concerns are taken care of, directly here answering the collectivist concern about organized military apparatuses, individualism in a society like this can be used to procure the greatest good for all. The idea generally being that individual greedy decisions taken inside a marketplace will create implicit incentives that will lead to more socially cohesive and productive behavior and disincentivize destructive, antisocial, and criminal behavior. And from this perspective, individualism starts looking good. It looked very compelling to Adam Smith, and various models of this form of individualism were were incorporated into future models of liberalism and liberal society. However, if we cut liberal society open and look at it even a little bit to see how it works, we'll understand immediately that this concept of individualism is not as thoroughgoing as we might imagine, and Danny Ducamp goes on immediately to reference just one of these features. However, I totally accept that there are many situations where a cohesive group is more effective. For example, one of the companies within that free market. That would need to be a cohesive group. I'm really glad that here Danny Ducamp mentions the corporation. Because the corporation follows the development of liberal society and our notion of individualism right from the start, right from its beginning in the 17th and 18th centuries. The corporation is, in many ways, the engine of the global economy, in many ways the engine of the national economy, and it is indisputably a collective. So what's gone wrong here? Let's build this from the ground up. First, you have the baker who does not bake bread from the goodness of his heart, as per Adam Smith, but because he wants to make a profit. As he makes more and more in profits, he can make more and more bread to serve more and more people, and everyone gains. Eventually, he reaches a point where he can no longer make all the bread himself, and so he needs to hire a worker who, in exchange for money, will now help the baker make 
more bread. Now in this scenario, the customers win because they get bread, the baker wins because he gets money, and the worker wins too because he also gets money. The incentives of the baker, the customers, and the worker are all aligned. The worker has a vested interest in his new boss doing well because it might mean more money in wages for himself, and of course, if the baker has to shut down, the worker will lose his job and income. Note how this analysis is all methodological individualism, and yet how the baker, the worker, and the customers are all cooperating to achieve these outcomes. If the customers wanted to collectivize uh, in order to take the bread from the baker by force, they could do so, but that would mean that they'd be unlikely to get any new bread tomorrow. Let's pretend that the baker continues to do really well and soon has a lot more staff. Now, what happens if the workers here collectivize and just try to uh, extort the baker for more money in wages? They, they're like, no, we're going to go on strike, baker. We want more money. Well, sure, they can try. Let's say the baker caves into their demands and doubles their wages. Well, the baker, if he doesn't do something to try to offset this extra cost in wages, uh, is going to go out of business. And so he has no choice but to double the price of his bread. Now, this has produced an outcome where the workers win at the expense of the customer. They win, the customers lose. But in the long run, maybe in this scenario, the more expensive bread is too much for most of the customers and they go off, they go and buy corn or some other product and uh, all but the die-hard bread fans abandon the bakery. So eventually the baker loses most of his trade and has to cut back on his production to uh, realign to the lower demand for his bread and therefore the number of workers has to be cut back also. So in the end, most people lose. The benefits are concentrated on the very few and the costs are socialized. This is the net effect of collectivism every single time. And this is the number one reason why individualism is superior. However, Distributist made another claim in his video in which he was saying that corporations are a form of collective action, and this is simply not true. They function exactly the same as the bakery that I just outlined, just on a grander scale. Let's move from the local baker to Bakery Incorporated, or Bakery Inc. Here, our baker does not have enough startup capital for a bakery, and so he seeks to pool his existing resources, uh, his existing savings, with other bakers, and they form together a joint stock company called Bakery Inc. Here, all that has happened is that the founders of this company have pooled their resources and pooled their risk. This is still entirely individualistic because they've entered into a free association in which they've agreed to go into a business venture together. The rest is exactly the same as the scenario I've outlined already. Let's take another scenario. This time the baker, rather than entering into a joint stock company, seeks to raise capital by pitching to venture capitalists. And now it is those capitalists who are pooling their resources and their risk and betting with their own money on the success of our baker here. This is still entirely in the realm of trade and cooperation and not of force or collective action. Let's take a third scenario. This time, our baker floats his company on the stock market. He offers people the chance to buy shares in Bakery Inc. Let's say people do so. Exactly the same. Pooled resources and pooled risk. In each of these cases, whether it's the joint stockholders, the venture capitalists, or the shareholders, the baker is making his company accountable to the vested interests of the various investors. But in every single case, he's selling a little piece of his company in exchange for a share in the profits of that company. To put it in very plain terms, the trade is money now for the baker in exchange for money later for the investor. And these are all entirely individualistic transactions on the free market. Now, does this mean that the incentives of the baker and the incentives of the workers are now aligned? Yes. Does it mean that the incentives of the baker and the incentives of the investors are now aligned? Yes, it does. 
Does it mean that these people are all largely working to the same end? Yes, but this does not mean it is collectivism. I'm afraid to say that all of distributors talk of corporations being examples of collectives fundamentally misunderstands what is meant by this term. I hope this has cleared things up. Now get out. And a very special thanks to Sir Percy Blakeney, the Crimson Satyr, the Ambivalent Onion, Andy Swainson, Bailey in Aurora, David Vacherche, Christopher Scholholm, Natural Rights, Binary Surfer, Holy Spatula, Hornito Jones, Kazga, Michael Tynan, Time Stealer, Toyo Tommy Ami, Tragic Vision, William Angus, Blake Barrows, and Edward Darrow.